Our Heavenly Father, there is not a more powerful message than the representation by the cross on Calvary. And today we do lift high the cross, the cross that Jesus came to suffer on and make the ultimate sacrifice for the world, for each of us. Today, Lord, we look up to the cross, we bow at the cross, we thank you for your love and your kindness and the sacrifice of Christ. Lord, for churches all across Nashville, the United States, and the face of the world on this Sabbath day Sunday, we pray the cross will be lifted high. Guide and direct our thoughts, our prayers, our songs, as we break the word of God together and share about the goodness of Christ and the love. In the name of Jesus, we pray all these things. the beginning, the price he would have to pay, for my heart had gone so far beyond what other loves forgave. I wasn't on that hillside to see my guilt was placed upon him. I know that somehow, somehow he saw me. Though I could not 
Good morning and welcome to worship with First Baptist Church of Nashville. With the beautiful sunshine, we all set our clocks ahead. The beautiful message Quinn has sung. We need to say a real good, strong amen, right? Amen. amen. We're glad you're here this morning. Thank you for joining us. We've been looking forward to this with great expectation and excitement to see how the Lord would work today in our hearts and lives. We have out-of-town guests and newcomer guests with us members, so be certain that you reach out to these seated nearby you before, during, and following worship today to help each other feel right at home this morning. You will find on the far right of your bulletin a communication card. Guest, especially so that you will be aware of this, please take a moment to register your attendance with us. Make note of how we might be in touch with you and be in communication with you as well as pray for you. And then simply place that in the offering plate today. Our members use it in that very way as a means of communicating with our minister, our ministers and our staff, and we hope you will as well. And then guest following worship, Pastor Frank will be in the foyer to my left. I hope you'll just take a moment. We have a gift for each of you. We'd love to share and get to meet you personally one-on-one -on -one in that way. We also welcome those tuning in on live through our live streaming. Our fellowship on Broadway is going at this very same time, worship service in the chapel. We're glad to welcome each of you, and especially for those of you broadcast tuning in with us. We will be studying in the book of 1 Corinthians today, the first chapter, verse 18, on the Pew Bible. You may find that, page 1050. As we prepare for the message today, be certain that you are prepared and looking into the Word of God as we study about the power of the cross in this powerful, powerful series on Christ, His love, and His sacrifice. God bless you and thank you for being here.
Good morning, friends. I'm so glad that you're here today. It's been a big weekend. We've had an RA lock-in and a GA sleep-in. I'm so glad that you're here this morning. You may remember that I mentioned I've been exercising a lot since January with a trainer, and so it's kind of like I have PE class three days a week. And I feel like I'm getting stronger. But one thing my coach asked me to do that I hate, I don't like doing it, I think it's silliness sometimes, it's an exercise called burpees. Does anyone know what a burpee is? No one? No one willing to demonstrate a burpee today? So if I, oh, you, you want to try? Go, go down there in the middle in front of the flowers and see if we can do a, a burpee, Tucker. You squat down and then kick your legs out and then bring your legs back in and then stand up. That's, and jump up high. That's one burpee. <laughs> and it might look kind of simple, but man, it is so hard. And sometimes I think this is crazy. Why are we doing this? But this is what I know. That exercise is making me stronger and it's getting easier and easier to do them. Some people look at us on Sunday mornings and think, oh, why in the world would they get up and go to church? Why don't they sleep in? Why don't they enjoy brunch as a family and watch cartoons on TV? I don't get it. Why would you go to church? That just sounds crazy to me. But you know what I've learned? Is that it makes me stronger. When I get up early to read my Bible in the morning and take time to spend with God instead of sleeping in, guess what it does? That may sound crazy or silly to some, but guess what? It makes me stronger. And sometimes maybe you don't want to come to choir or study for Bible drill, and your mom and dad or grandparent says, you know what, you need to work on this. Guess why? Because they know, just like my trainer knows, that it's going to make you stronger. Today, Pastor Frank is going to be preaching from a verse in 1 Corinthians. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is God's power to us who are being saved. I hope as you grow up, as Jesus did, you come to know that power and how God makes you strong. I love you very much. You may go back to your seats. As we continue with those thoughts this morning, let's sing together, Rescue the Perishing, Care for the Dying. Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. We've already sung it this morning, the power of the cross. Lift high the cross of Christ as we do so. He'll be about the business of drawing all men to himself because Jesus will save. Would you stand with me as we sing?
pray in just a moment for these we know undergoing stress or hospitalization, loss in their family. In just a moment, however, let me share with you those we do know in the hospital today. Our members Jim Tallman and Saritha Scaife each continue to be hospitalized more than a week now. Members, we are glad to visit you in the hospital and pray with you and for you. If you will communicate with us and let us know at such a time, we want to do so. We celebrate three new babies into our large church family. Grant and Sarah Wilkinson and their two sons welcome their daughter, McClary. Betsy and Dave Rossi welcome their daughter, BB. And I know grandparents Louie and Laurel are here today and excited about this first grandchild. Heather and Jimmy Hannibus welcome their son, Sterling William. And we celebrate with grandparents, Russ and Debbie Roach. We have prayed all week long for home missions, for missionaries across the United States and North America. As we prepare to receive and contribute our offering today, we remember those who are recipients and mission representatives of our throughout the North American continent. Would you join me please as we pray? Our Heavenly Father, for these who are hospitalized and others we might not be aware of, or some who are unable to attend today because of illness, we pray the Lord's healing hand upon them. For these three celebrating the birth of a newcomer into their families, the grandparents, the aunts and uncles, sisters and brothers, we celebrate the miracle of these three little ones now in our midst. Lord, our people, First Baptist Nashville, are such an aware people in prayer and such a generous and sacrificial people in contributing to the cause of making known the message of the cross around the world. And today, as we've been praying and conclude our week of prayer for North American missions, we want to be hope givers. We want to be partnered with over 2,500 missionaries in North America under the cause of Jesus Christ through the Baptist life. And so we pray you would receive our offerings to the global missions very well and multiply these, that boys and girls and men and women all over the North American continent will come to know Jesus Christ through our efforts. Lord, we pray you would bless these offerings and the givers today, and thank you for the privilege of serving you in this way. We pray all these things in Jesus' name.
We've been reminded this week by watching news accounts of an event that took place in Selma, Alabama 50 years ago when people marched across the bridge in an effort to register to vote. And they were met by strong opposition, human cruelty in a way that it's hard for us to imagine in our day and time today. Martin Luther King Jr. was there, and we often think of him as an agitator or the one who stirred up and led in so many brave and courageous ways as a civil rights leader. Sometimes we forget that he was a Baptist preacher. And as a Baptist preacher, there are some quotes that don't always come to mind when we hear of Martin Luther King Jr. But one of his quotes has to do with the cross. And of the cross and of Calvary, he said, that Calvary is a telescope through which we look into the long vista of eternity and see the love of God breaking forth into time. It's not so much that we are looking through the telescope from our end and seeing glory or seeing heaven as much as it is that God was looking through his telescope and he saw a world in need of being rescued. And the only way to do that was through the death of his son Jesus on the cross. Last week we started looking at a series of messages on the cross we talked about the effect of the cross last week in some detail, particularly the fact that we are forgiven from our sin, we are made pure, we have a better life today, we have hope for tomorrow. And today we're going to look at the message of the cross. In the weeks to come, we'll see a sermon on the triumph of the cross. As we approach Palm Sunday, we will be in the shadow of the cross and then, of course, on Easter Sunday, we will be celebrating as people whose lives are changed by the cross. Today, as we take a few moments to look at the message of the cross, we will pick up right where we were last Sunday in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, but we'll look over to verse 18. Last week, we spent our time in verse 17 as Paul is talking about the cross, and he's doing so at that particular point, it seems, uh, as if he's trying to bring some common ground to the divisions that were found in the church in Corinth. Lots of different issues that were going on there. If you know anything about the book of 1 Corinthians, you know how Paul speaks to uh, a variety of different concerns and, and issues that were uh, prevalent there, but he does so by bringing them to the cross. And then as if he just changes gears almost momentarily, he he, he talks about the message of the cross. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is God's power to us who are being saved. We're going to unpack this text a little bit this morning, and we'll do so by trying to answer a question, why the cross? And I want to make three suggestions or observations about why the cross in an attempt to try to answer that. I hope this will be helpful to you. The first thing that I would say is we, we look at biblical history. And you know this from your study or your reading of the Old Testament, that God has been actively involved in revealing himself throughout history. He did this first with Adam in the garden. God comes and walks in the garden with Adam and, and talks with Adam. He gives him instructions and says, everything here has been created for your delight. And Adam and Eve are told in no uncertain terms there, there's only one thing that you're not supposed to do. And of course, that's where the temptation came. 
God revealed himself to other Old Testament characters. We could skip around a little bit and we would find the story of Abram. And God speaks to Abram and God, God encourages Abram with this good news promise that he's going to bless him and bless all the nations who will bless him. And, and that through his seed, there's going to be a great nation that's uh, uncountable like the stars in the sky or the sand on the seashore. Abram has to learn to trust God. God reveals himself as a God who loves Abram. Abram doesn't always reflect that he understands that, but God doesn't leave him there. You can fast forward and you see the story of David. Same way God reveals his love to David. Uh, David is, you know, he is surrounded by God's presence when he goes into battle with Goliath. He is surrounded by God's presence when he becomes king. He is surrounded by God's presence when he unites the kingdoms. But David doesn't always live a perfect life. We fast forward that. We can hear the voices of the, the prophets as they would cry out to God's people to return to him. Now, God had revealed himself in love, but the people had rejected or rebelled against God. We get over to the New Testament. The stories are similar. We even come to our story, and our story is similar, that there's a God who loved us, a God who has revealed himself to us, and yet we still choose our way over God's way many times. We rebel or we reject what God's instructions are, and we find ourselves missing the point or missing the mark or, or somehow falling short of what God's ideal is. And so when we ask ourselves the question, why was the cross necessary? Well, God was revealing himself as a God of love, but historically, we rebelled against that. We rejected God's love. And this is the good news of the gospel right here. That God loved us so much, he did not leave us to ourselves. He didn't leave us perishing. He didn't leave us on a course of self-destruction. When we read this text from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, it talks about the way of perishing or the way of salvation. God did not leave us in the way or the path of perishing. That's, that's phenomenal news. Why the cross? Because there was no other way to bridge the gap between heaven and where we were. And God loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus to die on that cross to take our sin upon himself. That is the gospel. We look at this text, and perhaps we also draw from it uh, some, some helpful information to, to remind ourselves, what does it mean or what is it like to be lost or to be a person who is perishing? The word there that is used in this particular text, as well as in other texts, uh, for example, John 3, 16, uh, where, you know, if you don't believe, you're perishing. Uh, the idea is to be wrecked and rotting. Think of a ship that has been shipwrecked, and it's just, it's, it's, it's on the shore, it's not coming off, and, and over time, uh, the years, the storms that howl against it, the ship just continues to disintegrate and rot away. And that's what life is like for those of us who are lost. Now, our lives are wrecked and they're rotting. We may not recognize it at the time, but there comes a point when usually we do. The idea of perishing also has with it the idea of waste or loss, that my life is wasted. Uh, there, there's nothing good within me. There's, there's nothing that I can do to save myself. I have, I have wasted opportunities. I have wasted God's love. I have wasted some of the, uh, the, the, the sense of, of God's promise for my future. And, and some of those losses can never be regained for a lost person. The idea of perishing obviously means to die. It means that we are dying to, uh, because of sin in our life. It is, it is the curse that is upon us. In that sense, every one of us is terminal. We think about being destroyed or being ruined because of sin in our life. 
And that's what it means to be in the way of perishing. Now, uh, usually we caution people when they say uh, something like, well, there are two kinds of people in the world. You, you know, well, no, there's not. There's three or four, five, six different kinds of people in the world, aren't there, you know? But somebody says there's two kinds of people in the world. For Paul, that was a pretty typical thing. There's Jew, there's Gentile. There's slave, there's free. There's male, and there's female. But when it comes to this particular text, Paul is, well, he's crystal clear about it. There are two kinds of people in the world. There are those who are in the way of perishing and those who are in the way of being saved. You're either perishing because you consider the message of the cross to be foolishness. It seems like absolute ridiculous folly that that somebody could die on the cross 2,000 years ago and that would have the opportunity for you to, to somehow trust his actions to take your sin and remove them from you so that you can have a right relationship with God. It seems foolish to many who are on that side of belief that the whole world and everybody ever born needs to come to that realization as well. That seems like a foolish, outlandish idea that, that you can only be saved if you know who Christ is as, as the Son of God who uh, took away the sin of the world. But that's what the Bible says. And that's what we believe. And as we believe that, we preach that, we teach that, we live that, we share that, we bear witness of that. Paul saw two kinds of people in the world, those who are perishing and those who are being saved. Being saved means to be delivered or to be redeemed. It doesn't mean that you're perfect. It means that you're forgiven. It means that you're kept from harm. You're preserved or rescued. From a spiritual standpoint, it means to be delivered or to be rescued from sin and judgment. Because of the sin in my life and in your life, we deserved God's wrath. We deserved God's punishment. A holy God should have turned His back on you and on me. God chose not to leave us on the way to perishing. Instead, God sent His Son Christ. And the cross was in His mind as if He were looking through the lenses of eternity and He saw exactly when love needed to become real for each one of us. To be saved is to be healed. It is to be healed of our disease of being sinners. Paul would write to the Roman church and he would say, Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might dare to die. That's human nature. But then he says, This is God's nature. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Looking through that long telescope, looking through the lenses of eternity, he saw you and he saw me when we needed a Savior most, and at just the right time, Christ died for us. That's the cross. That's the message of the cross. It points to a conclusion that I'd like to make today that I would simply call the unpredictable God. Here it is. First of all, the cross is a scandalous means of salvation. To hang on a cross was to be shamed and to be ridiculed in the nth degree of its day. 
It was a painful death. It was a, a death that no one would desire for anyone in their family, but it was a scandalous means of death that would mark or stain the family reputation for years to come. And for God to choose a scandalous way for Christ to die as opposed to a lesser or non-scandalous way might just be God's way of identifying with the scandal of sin in our life. We needed a Savior who would die for the very worst in us, not just the worst of us but the worst in you and you and you and you and me. We needed a God who would see exactly how far we had come from his ideal, who would, who, who would see how far we had missed the mark. And that God would not turn his back on us, but instead the cross would somehow reach into where we were and be our means of rescue. It would be our means of healing. It would be our means of cleansing. It's the cross. It's nothing else. It's what Christ accomplished on that cross. As scandalous as it was, that was the very plan of God. But then this unpredictable God goes and does, I believe, one more thing. The cross is a demonstration that God works in defiance of human standards and expectations. Who would, have, who would have expected? Who would have fathomed? Who would have dreamed? Who, who would have imagined that the God of creation, who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, would empty himself and take on the form of a servant. And as a servant would take your sin and my sin upon his shoulders and march up Calvary's rough journey and there offer himself as a ransom for our sin. You didn't think of that. I didn't think of that. My standards and my expectations might have been such that God would have somehow swooped down in a chariot of fire with, with an army of angels and that Christ would have wielded his sword and would have just put all the foes of mankind in their place and ridden out triumphantly and offered anyone who wanted to follow that to follow. God works. This unpredictable God would remind every one of us that our human standards of success and measurement are somehow nullified by the implement of salvation that he chose to use. Pick up your cross, and you have to follow him. You know, the message of the cross is such incredible good news because the God who is defiant over humankind's expectations and standards has somehow bridged the incredible gulf between heaven and He says, whosoever will may come. So do you know Christ as your Savior? If so, the message of the cross is not foolishness to you. It makes absolute sense by faith. You may not have all the intricacies of the details put together, but you know in your heart you came to a point of recognizing that you were a sinner in need of a Savior. You could not save yourself. 
Only God could do something for you. He's done that in Christ. You've trusted him as your Savior. Or somehow you find yourself in that other category. Ah, you're trying to figure it out. You're not going to budge until you do. You're, you're not going to take any steps of faith until it makes absolute sense to you on this side. You've got stoic philosophy. You've got Roman pride. You've got all those things that would have been a part of the people in Paul's day. And it seems like absolute foolishness to you, and you won't believe. There are two kinds of people in this world. There are those who are on the way to perishing. There are those on the way to salvation. This is the gospel. Believe it. I want you to bow your head with me for just a moment. Our Father, today, it is my prayer that you will take the words from your word and, God, you will make them richly applicable to every life in this room. For those of us who have given our heart to Christ, it's not because we were better or good or in any way deserving. It's simply because we threw ourselves on the grace and the mercy of a God who didn't turn his back on us when he should have. God, if there's anybody in this room that's never given their heart to Christ, I pray that this would be the day that your spirit draws them and convinces them of the truth of the gospel, that there's a God who loves them, that forgiveness is possible, not because they've cleaned up their act, but because you're a God who is rich in mercy and grace. You do not treat us as our sins deserve. Oh God, draw men and women and boys and girls to your throne. Save them by your power. Rescue them, redeem them, heal them. We ask these things today in Christ's name. I'm going to be standing down here at this altar. Tom's going to join me, other ministers that are in this room. If we can pray with you, if we can encourage you in any way, we'd be so honored to do that this morning. If you're looking for a place to call your church home, now's the time to join. And the way we do that in this church is you present yourself here at the altar and we take care of all the connections of former churches and those things. You just come and tell us you know Christ is your Savior and you want to make First Baptist your home. Let's stand together and sing our invitation to Him and you come.
you be seated for just a moment? We have one that has come this morning, and he and I are going to spend a little bit of time after our service talking about uh, what it means to follow Christ in baptism. And William, thank you for being present today and for joining us here at the front. I want to introduce to you for just a moment Duro Arianola. Duro was uh, a student here in Nashville when First Baptist Church uh, put your arms around he and his family and loved him and helped support him in many different ways. And Duro, if you'll make your way uh, to the pulpit for just a moment, I'm going to share with you just a little bit about Duro, and then we're going to have a little prayer time together as a church. I think this is so important. Duro is currently the general secretary of all of Africa Baptist Fellowship. He has had many different leadership positions over the years with the Baptist World Alliance. His home is Nigeria. I had a brief opportunity to visit with Duro for just a few minutes this morning before our service, and I said, Duro, I want to make sure that our people know you and can put a name and face together. There are many of you that were perhaps um, here when Duro and his family first came to Nashville and you began to uh, love on them and encourage them. Uh, one of the things that uh, I asked Duro about today, I said, you know, we want to pray intelligently for the situation that's going on in our world today, not only with ISIS, but also with uh, um, uh, Bro Haram, and that, that entire situation that we hear about, particularly this weekend, as these two uh, terrorist forces have, have now found some common ground to link together. And uh, Duro gave me just a, a little bit of a story about that. So, Duro, I'm going to ask you to come and just share a little bit, as you did with me in my office, and tell the people about the situation in northern Nigeria so they can pray for you. Thank you, Pastor. Before I tell you about the present situation in Africa, especially in Nigeria, like the pastor said, I want to say thank you for investing in my life and that of my family. Few years ago, we came as a visitor to this church. You welcomed us, you provided us with whom are we from whom. Your investment in us has helped us to work with the Nigeria Baptist Convention, and presently I'm working with Baptist World Alliance as a regional secretary for All Africa Baptist Fellowship. I want to thank my Sunday school class. I want to thank Dr. Ross. Thank you. Do you know that today, as we are worshiping the only living God today and singing to him, in the northeast of Nigeria, Christians are not allowed even to worship. Not because they don't want to worship, but because Boko Haram has driven them away from their home. They are now refugees in their homeland. If there is anything I want you to do, I want you to pray that the Lord will intervene and stop the spread of Islamic insurgencies in Nigeria, in Kenya, in South Sudan, and in other parts of Africa. The pastor have asked me, what can you do apart from praying? And I've told him how you can practically demonstrate your love to people in Nigeria. If I don't know of anything, I know of First Baptist Church in Meduguri, we are once upon a time, over 1,000 people worship in that church. But today, even if they will worship, hardly can you find 50 in that church. The plan of the Boko Haram is to wipe up Christianity and then to establish Islamic religion. Pray for us. We need your prayers. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Dear 
We're going to pray for Duro, and I'm going to invite some of you that perhaps knew Duro when you were, he was in your Sunday school class here, or others that would just like to come and stand around him. And Duro, if you'll take your place here at the front, and I'm just going to ask them to lay their hands on you as we pray together today. And I want to reiterate what Duro said there in closing, that if there is something tangible that we can do as a church, it is to make an offering for the Baptist World Alliance or the Nigerian Baptist Convention to assist with the homeless, jobless, and the hungry people who have lost so much because of Boko Haram and their influence already. Church, I'll invite you to pray with me as I lead us in this prayer time together. Our Father, today we come as a family of Christians who pause to recognize for just a moment that some in our extended family are hurting in ways that seem so hard for us to even imagine. We see the nightly news and we, we hear of the work of terrorist organizations like Broko Haram, as well as ISIS. And Father, we wonder how long it's going to go and we wonder how much more um, terror they're going to instill in the hearts and lives of people around the world. And particularly, Father, as we have heard of the persecution directed against Christians. And Father, we, we lift... We lift this situation to you. We spread it out before you. We ask that you would somehow do a miracle that seems to be even foolish to some of our imagination today. Father, you would turn the hearts of the leaders of Broko Haram and ISIS and you would turn their hearts toward you. That, God, you would save them radically by the cross of Jesus Christ and because of the shed blood of Jesus that died for every sinner. God, you would rescue them and heal them, turn their hearts in such a way that, that their entire actions dedicated towards terrorism would be stifled and would be stopped. God, short of a miracle like that, we would pray for the wisdom of others who are going to be uh, looking for a military response. And Father, please give courage and bravery, but intelligence mostly to those that are considering whatever options can be uh, taken to stop the spread of this terror. God, we lift up our brothers and sisters who are in northeast Nigeria and who are in Kenya and the Sudan who are in Syria, in so many parts of the world, Father, where today being a Christian is is so detrimental to their life. God, give them strength. Give them courage. Whatever happens, God, would you bring glory to yourself, either through their rescue and deliverance, or, Father, as they uh, perhaps face martyrdom, we we pray, God, that you'll bring glory to yourself, that men and women might come to know Christ. God, thank you for Duro. Thank you for his dedication. Thank you for the small part that this church played in investing in his life. And God, give him strength as he returns to Nigeria. Watch over him. Keep him safe. May his voice not be silenced, but God, give him strength as he encourages and preaches to the body of Christ and witnesses of his faith. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's people said, amen. All right. Tom, do we have any closing words today before we prepare to dismiss? Congregation, let me remind you, how close Easter is. Spring's gonna be here tomorrow and Easter is only four weeks away. So now is the time that we believers continue sharing hope and encouragement and love in our community. Leading up to Easter, certainly, many in our lives don't know Jesus Christ yet. And you may be the key for one or two or three in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in your school. Please be praying toward Easter, April 5th and 
want to inform you that on Friday, April 3rd, we have our second journey night. Pastor Frank will be teaching from the book of Mark, beginning with the 8th chapter, clear through the remainder of the book, twice that day at 10 a.m., and a repeat session of the same uh, uh, portion at 7 p.m. We're looking forward to two full houses that day in the chapel. You may find uh, a way to sign up with our church office or our website. That's Friday, April 3rd, and of course, Easter Sunday, April 5th. Mark them in big red letters, not only on your calendar, but in your heart, as we make a difference for Jesus Christ. Pastor. Joe's going to dismiss us with a great hymn. Let's stand together and sing. <laughs> 